After considering uh, the fall of Babylon for some time, my thoughts went beyond that to <clears throat> the temple that Jesus is building and the completion of this work. <clears throat> that's a much better thing to consider because <clears throat> that's the eternal that's eternal habitation. That's the eternal thing. <clears throat> This text that Brother Judah read, if you're familiar with the scriptures, you know this is an excerpt of Solomon's prayer at the completion of the temple that he built for the Lord. And <clears throat> we're going to read some more of that. I've entitled this message uh, with this question that Solomon asked, Will God indeed dwell in the earth? <clears throat> First Kings chapter 8 Beginning at verse 25, this is also found in First or uh, Second Chronicles 6. <clears throat> now this is again, this is Solomon's prayer. <clears throat> Therefore, now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that Thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. Now take note that what God promised was that there would not fail a man in his sight to sit on the throne of Israel. <clears throat> and the purpose of this was so that his children would take heed to their way, and they'd walk before me as as David walked before God. So this requires a king, and God promised the king's going to sit on the throne of David in the sight of God, not, not always necessarily in the sight of men, but in the sight of God. God's provided a king to lead his children in the right way. And the prophets spoke of this. We know this is fulfilled in Christ. Peter pronounced it in Acts 5.31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And Paul proclaimed it in Acts 13. Of this man's seed, that is David's seed, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. <clears throat> So we want to consider this morning what Jesus is doing in the temple that he is building. Now Solomon's underlying request in his prayer here was that God come and dwell in this temple that he had just built. Amen. And kind of if you read between the lines what Solomon's saying is that I know if, if you, Lord, if you come and dwell in this temple that I've built, I know that's, that means you'll, you're establishing my kingdom here. You're a stat I'm the one, or at least the first one, that you promised to David. If you come and dwell in this temple, I know I've, I have your approval. Well, you can see the, the type of Christ in this. When, when God moves into the temple that Jesus has built, it will be a sure sign of his approval of what Jesus has done and the fulfillment of his promise. So this is what Solomon's asking. Let's continue in verse 27. So Solomon, he's, as I, as I said, you kind of read between the lines, he's asking the Lord to, to give his approval and dwell in this temple. But then in verse 27, I'm sorry, I skipped verse 26. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David my father. So verify it, Lord, by dwelling in this temple and approving of what we have built here. Then verse 27, he considers again, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Is this even possible? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built. Yet, even though Solomon, he, he's considering now, even though I know God in His fullness can't dwell in this temple that I built. Yet, and I'm going to make a request, Have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day. If, if you can't dwell here in your fullness, 
at least we ask that your eyes be upon this place all the time because we prepared it for you which thy servant prayeth before thee today, even toward the place which thou hast said. You said this, Lord, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. So not only, Solomon's asking, not only hearken to my prayer, but, and you know the rest of the prayer that he prays in the following verses, if anyone look toward this temple and pray, if anyone come to this place where you've put your name, Lord, and pray, we ask that you hear, because this place is prepared for you to dwell in. <clears throat> so now, I want to answer Solomon's question this morning, will God indeed dwell in the earth? <clears throat> the answer is yes. Isaiah 40, verse 22 says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. That's the heavens that we might say the universe or outer space, or however vast that may be, we haven't discovered its boundaries yet. God just God spreads that out as his tent, and yet it, it doesn't contain his fullness. <clears throat> So the problem here is not, the problem in finding a suitable habitation for God is it's not space. That's not the problem. It's, it's a container for His glory. It's, it's not that He needs more space. That's not the problem. It's not physical size and geography, for God is a spirit. <clears throat> if the container is proper, God can dwell in it. <clears throat> all the, for example, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily. Amen. Now that, as far as physical size, that's not a big size, but the container was proper. <clears throat> now in Isaiah 66, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? <clears throat> and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath my hand made. What, what are you going to build a house of God out of it. You'll have to use the things that he's made in order to do that. <clears throat> and by the way, all those things have been. They've, those things have already exist, existed. You can't build God a new house. <clears throat> Where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But, now God's, he's considering a dwelling place, but to this man will I look. God is looking for a place to dwell. And I'll look to this man, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. <clears throat> but now in the present time, <clears throat> we know there's a great separation between God and man and between heaven and earth. <clears throat> other than by faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. <clears throat> Everyone knows that when you speak about heaven, you're not speaking about someplace here on earth. Everyone knows this. We're, when you speak about heaven, you're speaking of where God dwells, and it's just even among the heathen, people know that there's a great distance between heaven and earth. <clears throat> there's a drastic difference between heaven and earth also, as Nebuchadnezzar learned and testified, the heavens do rule. <clears throat> now, let's consider what Jesus taught about the rich man and Lazarus. <clears throat> there are some places that can never be joined together. We learn this in this account. Jesus made it plain. And beside all this, <clears throat> this is Abraham's reply to the rich man, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence or from where you're at. <clears throat> so Jesus established here at least three facts about heaven and hell. One, there is a great gulf between them. And number two, that this great gulf is fixed. This is permanent and forever. This gulf is fixed. <clears throat> and not only are these two places never to be joined, but the persons in these places are not going to be transferred to the other place. This is impossible. 
That's also what's meant by the great gulf being fixed. Those in torments and hell will never be transferred to heaven, and those who died in the faith and are in heaven with the Lord can never be transferred to hell. This separation is fixed. Mm -hmm. However, I use that to say that nothing like this is said of heaven and earth. <clears throat> On the contrary, Scripture records a great deal of interaction between heaven and earth, <clears throat> going up and coming down. Mm -hmm. But mainly now, God or His representatives are coming down, <clears throat> as we'll see. A few examples, first and foremost in the Garden of Eden. Here, after God had created the garden and placed Adam and Eve in it, Scriptures record in Genesis 3.8, that they, this is after they sinned, of course. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So this is a remarkable thing. Here right off, even, even after they had sinned, God came down to earth in some sense and walked in the cool of the day in the garden. <clears throat> It's significant now that God, God planted this garden and he put Adam and Eve in it and then he came to it. <clears throat> and the only, now, the earth, the earth is a big place compared to just Adam and Eve, right? They're the only two people on the whole face of the earth, but where they were at is the place to which God came. <clears throat> so now I think this is a shadow of greater things to come. <clears throat> when God will come to be with his creation. Now there are other instances in the scriptures where the scriptures specifically say God came down, not always for good. For example, the Tower of Babel, God came down to see. And he's, the scriptures record he came down to deliver Israel from Egypt. And he came down to Sinai. And he came down to Moses at the door of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And the prophets spoke of God coming down. Isaiah 31, 4. For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. Consider that the Lord would even do this, come down and fight for a place on the earth. There, this is indicative of, of something that God is doing, that he would consider a, such a thing as this. Amen. And the next verse says, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. Isaiah 64, 1, O oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. <clears throat> Verse 2, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Verse 3, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. <clears throat> For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. And what has he prepared? The next verse, verse 5 says, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. God meets. Now, we're going to go up, but, but here in this text, God's coming down. He comes down to meet those that rejoice and work in righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Psalm 18 is a, a wonderful psalm. If you've ever, whenever you experience a great deliverance from the Lord, you'll want to read Psalm 18. This is one of David's great deliverances. Verses 6, 9, and 10. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry became, came before him even unto his ears. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. Verse 10. Furthermore, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. God, he did this to deliver his servant David. So how 
Not only does the Lord come down to earth, but in certain circumstances, He comes very quickly. Yeah. Flies to the earth. So, <clears throat> now, I'm kind of making a contrast here because we, we're accustomed to this great separation between earth and heaven. We know the, the earth is groaning in travail under the yeah. burden of man's sin. It's corrupt. The Lord's already declared it's going to be destroyed and pass away. There's, now, we're talking about the new heavens and the new earth that God is going to come down to this. <clears throat> So you want to you want to get used to this idea <clears throat> of all the interaction between heaven and earth recorded in Scripture about the only thing going up from earth to heaven are men's words and prayers calling out to God. We know Enoch was translated and Elijah was taken up in a fiery chariot, but these were not things that they did of themselves. Even these were the works of God. <clears throat> so the greater majority of the activity has been God coming down and seeing and sending upon the earth. <clears throat> Jesus said, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, that God would send his Son into a sinful world. <clears throat> is an amazing consideration. Yeah. Now, did a Savior from among the men of the earth go up to heaven to save us? No. The Savior came down from heaven and ascended up again. <clears throat> now, would God do all of this if He intended that there always be a vast chasm between heaven and earth and between Himself and the earth? The Lord will come to meet and fellowship with His redeemed ones when all things that He has purposed have been fulfilled in Christ. So there must be a fullness of this yet to come. <clears throat> Amen. We see God operating in this manner in the ancient shadows of the tabernacle ministry, in the building of the temple in Jerusalem, in the choosing of a specific people, a specific land. Again, th this is all on the earth. A specific land on the earth, a specific city in that land, a specific temple in that city, a specific room in that temple, the most holy place. So God, there's, he's got some attention focused here on this earth. <clears throat> Amen. Now there is going to be a suitable dwelling place made for God in the new earth, and Jesus is preparing this place for him. Yeah. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in Him. So here's an indication that there's going to be a joining. Yeah. Now, if heaven and earth are always going to be separate, how can you say we're going to gather it all into one? Mm -hmm. So at some point, heaven and earth are going to be brought together. <clears throat> Jesus is in the process of making the redeemed ones compatible with heaven, and he's also going to make a new earth that is compatible with heaven. And the end result will be that all things in heaven and earth will be gathered together in perfect harmony. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven. <clears throat> Jesus is doing this for God. <clears throat> All of this is another way of saying he shall build the temple of God. <clears throat> now the present earth cannot be God's temple. The present heavens and earth serve a purpose, but it is not the dwelling place of God. Think of the, the present heavens and the earth are kind of like the the, the linen clothes and the napkin that covered Jesus when he was in the grave. It, it serves a purpose for a time, but there's going to be, and, and Paul proclaims this in Hebrews, quoting from the Psalms, that there's going to be a time where he takes it, he t takes it off like a garment, and he's going to fold it up and lay it aside, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. <clears throat> Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. Mm -hmm. 
but thou remainest. They shall all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. Mm -hmm. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So the present heaven and earth are like the linen clothes and the napkin that covered the dead body of Jesus. They, they served a purpose, <clears throat> but they'll be folded up and laid aside. Now I want to consider this dream that Jacob had <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, Jacob, in his dream, he didn't see a ladder in heaven that came down. He saw a ladder set up on the earth, and it went up. Now, the scriptures don't say, but I can imagine Jacob's thinking, I want to I wanna go up that ladder. Or at least, if we were reading the following verses, he looked. He looked up the ladder to see what was up there at least. Verse 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it. So he saw that much. He looked up the ladder and he saw the Lord and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Now this is amazing that Jacob, he's probably, he's wanting to know what's up at the top of the ladder, and the Lord starts speaking about down there where he's at. Where the, the rocks you're sleeping on, the land you're on, Jacob, I want to talk to you about that down there on the earth. <clears throat> I'm going to give it to you and your seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou... See how he keep, he's talking about things on the earth here. <clears throat> I'll bring thee again to this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of to thee. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God here in the earth, and this is the gate of heaven. Now Jacob concluded the place on the earth was the house of God, and the gate to heaven was there. <clears throat> Jesus, you know, uses this same language in John chapter 1, and Jesus speaking of himself. He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So there is a way for man to see into the open heavens, and there is a way for the ministers of God, the holy angels, to descend and ascend to the earth. <clears throat> and these holy angels, are they not all ministering servants sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? They're ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What this, they're involved in this work that Jesus is doing in building the temple of God. This is the ministry of the angels. Now, we, they do a lot of different things. The Lord's given the angels a lot of power and glory. But you can, the end result of their work is that they're working with Christ. They're doing what He's doing, and the Lord has enabled them to do this work. This is preparatory for the world to come. <clears throat> Now, a proof of this, three different texts in, Rev in the book of the Revelation. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now, this is when Jesus is reigning, of course, has ascended up into heaven and all things being given unto him. And another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And Revelation 18, verse 1, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven. And chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. So God does not spend a lot of time and effort developing something that he is going to just obliterate and do away with. So that's what I'm showing you is a lot of activity from heaven to earth here in these things. Because this is going to be, the, the new earth is going to be the dwelling place of God. <clears throat> Jesus also spoke of the world to come. <clears throat> Matthew 12, 32. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. 
But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And parallel passages in Mark 10.30 and Luke 18.30. He shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, yeah. eternal life. Now, why would Jesus use that kind of language if, if God had no intentions of ever being here? Why, why wouldn't he just say, in heaven, eternal life. No, he says, in the world to come. This is, this is significant that he talks like this. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Hebrews 6, 5, And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Jesus will bring his people with him, Paul taught the Thessalonians, some of them had erred, did not understand uh, what would happen to their loved ones that had died in the Lord. So Paul taught them in 1 Thessalonians 4.14, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, bring where? Where is he going to bring? He's going to bring them here when he comes here. <clears throat> Now let me state very clearly that I'm not, I'm not saying that there will no longer be a heaven, <clears throat> but that heaven and earth will be joined together in one. No more will Jesus be in one place and his people in another place. <clears throat> no more God in heaven and men on earth. No more separation between heaven and earth. No more scattered people. But all will be together and in one place. This is the great work that Jesus is doing. Yeah. Consider what is heaven. <clears throat> if, if the Godhead were to leave heaven, would it still be heaven? See, heaven's not a location. It's not an address or a place on a map. Heaven is wherever God is. God is what makes it heaven. <clears throat> Yes, amen. has nothing necessarily to do with location. Heaven and earth will be joined by God coming down to the new earth. He will not, now he's not going to leave an empty space called heaven <clears throat> far away, but he will bring heaven with him. Amen. Now consider this, some teach that there will be only a select number of the saints that will go to heaven and the remainder of the saints will remain here on the earth in separation. Now this is, they're talking about the world to come, about eternity, is, this is how they speak of eternity. Now this, is, this does not appeal to me at all. And this is not at all what Jesus is doing. He said God commissioned him to bring all things together into one and to reconcile all things to God. So <clears throat> this is no reward that God would give. <clears throat> Colossians 1.20 says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth. <clears throat> now everything that Jesus is doing is to eliminate separation of the people of God and to reconcile all things to God. He's working to prepare a dwelling place of God among his people and all of his people. This is what Jesus is doing. He's reconciling. He's building. He's bringing many sons to glory and he's gathering together. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. <clears throat> now this is the glorious truth that I want to see better and I, that I want to share with you this morning. <clears throat> now my intention is not to uh, cause you to focus your attention on this present world which is going to pass away, <clears throat> but to see a little better how great a thing that God is doing through Jesus Christ and the inheritance that we have ahead of us. <clears throat> there will be a new earth and God has plainly stated this <clears throat> in Scripture. Isaiah 65, 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. 
In Isaiah 66, 22, for as the new heavens and the new for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. <clears throat> and then Peter reiterates this pro promise in 2 Peter 3, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, well in, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And Jesus promised it to the meek, the meek shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> Amen. John saw... Now in Revelation chapters 20 and tw 21 and 22, John saw the fulfillment of what we are talking about here. <clears throat> Revelation 21 verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, <clears throat> prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The holy city, it didn't start here, it started there, and it came down. Well, where, where is it coming down to? It's coming down to the new earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. out, of, out from God, out of heaven. <clears throat> and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, what is this? that John just saw. The tabernacle of God is with men. And He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. And God Himself shall be with them, and shall be their God. What is the location of God's dwelling place? It's the holy city that came down to the new heaven and the new earth. Now, John says the same thing again. A few verses later, verses 9 and 10. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. <clears throat> Now for the rest of chapter 21 and 22, John describes, he's describing this city that he saw, which is the bride, the lamb's wife, which is the new Jerusalem, the holy city, which is the dwelling place of God. This is what he's talking about. Verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. Now, at the present time, <clears throat> there, are, there is a separate place called the temple where God dwells. But John says, in this new city, I didn't see a temple. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a special building or a special place within the city set aside for God to dwell in. I didn't see that. <clears throat> there is no special place like that in this city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. That is, the entire city is their dwelling place. When you're in New Jerusalem, you're in the temple of God. This city, the Lamb's wife, was built to be the habitation of God. In verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Notice that everything glorious and honorable is brought into this city. And added to it. There's no talk of anything ever being carried out. Shouldn't some glory and honor be reserved for heaven? Well, this city is heaven. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. <clears throat> now, this is where chapter 21 ends and chapter 22 begins, but we should be careful that uh, we're not we're not disconnected in our thoughts here because what John continues seeing in chapter 22 he's still looking and examining this city this is what he continues to describe in chapter 22 <clears throat> and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the lamb yeah. the throne of God yeah. that's in this city that's where he's looking <clears throat> The throne is in the holy city now. It is, that's what he said in 
Chapter 21, verse 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. <clears throat> also in this city, chapter 22, verse 2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, mm -hmm. and his servant shall serve him. <clears throat> Still speaking about the new Jerusalem, John saw the throne of God and of the Lamb were in it. <clears throat> what else do we see in the city? Verse 4 and 5, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. On the, just to make certain that we understand that John is still looking at the city. He hasn't shifted his eyes to a different location. He didn't start looking at the city and then look up someplace to heaven. He's still looking at the city. Chapter 22, verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. That's where all this is at. That's where God has made his dwelling place, the place that Christ has prepared for him. It's a holy city that came down from God out of heaven, and God dwells in it. Yeah. So like... All the other good things, even the tree of life, is in the holy city. <clears throat> it is the new Jerusalem, the Lamb's wife, and the temple of God. In it is the throne of God, and light, and the river of water of life. So to answer Solomon's question, will God indeed dwell in the earth? The answer is yes. This city is his habitation, and our habitation forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen.